But it is underway, that's the important thing. So David has written an article about the many activities, not only the tower, but the other types of rehab and renovation of the church that are taking place. And then, very importantly, there's an article in the newsletter by Lucas Lloyd uh, on, the, on, on the stewardship campaign uh, that is beginning now and coming into the fall. Uh, Lucas has dubbed it a campaign to inspire. So read his article, read his appeal for helping hands uh, to make this stewardship campaign in this fall a success. Uh, it's, it's a great article, and if you want to talk to Lucas about it, uh, I don't believe he's going to be here this week, but he will be here next week and the weeks following. And we'll even have, give him opportunity to speak about the stewardship campaign in the next several weeks. Uh, and there's plenty of other news in the, in the newsletter. There's a calendar in there. There's an outline of the strategic process that we're, the, the planning process that we're going through. There's plenty in the newsletter. And as I said, there are copies uh, on, the, on the table in the narthex. And also we have distributed this online at, on our Facebook page, on our web page, and by email. So one way or another, you should be able to get a copy of the newsletter uh, to see. I just want to make one final note. Next Sunday, I will not be present, but Mark Armesto will be preaching, and John Long will be uh, leading worship. So in their capable hands, you will be next Sunday. Are there any other matters of general congregational interest that anyone would like to announce? Seeing none, then let's set aside all of that stuff. All that stuff that's going to happen in the future, later today, later this week, in the months and weeks ahead. Put it all aside, and with me, focus your hearts and your minds and your spirits on the reason that we're here this homecoming Sunday, which is to worship the Lord our God. Good morning, Good morning and welcome, welcome to First Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church. Church. Please, Please stand, stand as you are able to worship God. God. I, wait I wait for the, for the Lord. Lord. The soul, soul waits, waits and in God's, God's word I hope. hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. 
more than those who watch for the morning. In faith, let us turn to our God, whose love is sure. Be seated. Good morning, good morning. Would all the children and young at heart like to join us up front? Come on, I know there's a lot of you. I've seen you hiding in all the pews. we have. Look at this. How wonderful to see all of you. Hey, Connor, you got your space, you got on your cowboy boots today? Huh? Let me see. Oh, no cowboy boots today. Wow, how wonderful to see all of you. And I have to take care of a little business right now because I was late today due to emergency with my mom. So uh, I need elders who can do communion. One, two, three, four, five. We need one more, is there someone here? Mark, six, okay, if you guys can all go to the back, you know when. And also uh, Obed and his friend are going to be the acolytes, so if you could help them to get in their robes and get down with the bread and the wine, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. And I apologize to all of you for having to do church business here, but uh, we had a little bit of a crisis at home. Geez, you know, we hadn't actually planned on having Sunday school today, but we're gonna. Because <laughs> there's an army here, so we'll go upstairs and have some good time. Mel, I want you to hold on to that for me. Okay, Rosie, I need your help, so I need you to put your phone away, please. Can you do that for me? And William, you want to do that one? Okay, I'm going to ask my three readers to come up here. Rosie, come on up. Oh my God, did the world end sometime earlier today that I wasn't informed about? All right, Mel, you want to start? But when the crowds knew it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed of healing. All right. uh, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Philoman one seventeen. All right, Rosa, what is your say? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence, so that also may. 
Thank you very much. You guys can go back and sit. Did you hear a word that was in every single one of those readings? Starts with a W. Did you hear that word? It was in every single reading. The word was welcome. Did you ever hear this song? Welcome home, welcome. Come on in and close the door. You've been gone so long. Welcome, welcome home. And that's what today is about, welcoming people home. It's homecoming Sunday. When I was a little girl, I used to go to a homecoming Sunday every other year. My grandmother lived in Arkansas. That's where my family's from. And I got a lot of family there. My grandmother was the fifth of 24 children. So I have lots and lots and lots of cousins. And every other year, my family would pack ourselves into our station wagon and drive from Buffalo, New York, all the way down to Ozark, Arkansas. And we did that so we could be there in church for homecoming Sunday. I never attended that church as a regular member, but I was a part of that church family. Because as we'll talk about again on World Communion Sunday, the church family isn't just the folks we see here in this church. Our church family exists in every church. In every church across this country, there are people worshiping God and learning about Jesus and celebrating his life. And we do the same thing here. So today, I welcome you home. I welcome you to the house of the Lord. I welcome you to a joyous Sunday where we're going to celebrate that time together our opportunity to be welcomed into the house of God and for us to have an opportunity to welcome those out in the world to come with us to God's house as well. So let's say a prayer before we go up to Sunday school and we're going to walk up quietly, please. Gracious God, we thank you for this wonderful home that you have made for us, a place here on earth to gather, to worship you, to support and love each other. We look forward to the home that you have made us in heaven and the day that you will welcome us there. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, seeker of the lost, draw your children back to your loving embrace. Restore us to our inheritance as daughters and sons, and reconcile our hearts to you, that we may become ambassadors of your reconciling love to all the world. Through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Trusting the grace promised to us in Jesus Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another. pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have strayed from your ways. Like the prodigal son, we have wasted our inheritance. You gave us the earth for our home, but we squander earth's resources and hoard its bounty. You gave us neighbors to love, but we pursue selfish ambitions. Forgive us our sin and bring us to repentance. Draw our wandering hearts back to you, that we may find freedom in obedience to your love. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. As a parent welcomes home a wayward child, so God embraces all who return in true repentance. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ, we know God's forgiveness and peace. Let us share that peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. As we continue with worship, please keep this joy of seeing each other together, and we'll do this after the service. This morning's Old Testament lesson is from Jeremiah, chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. It may be found on page 727 in the Red Pew Bibles. The Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed before the temple of the Lord. This was after King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had taken into exile the king of Jerusalem, Jeconiah, son of Joachim of Judah, together with the officials of Judah, the artisans and the smiths, and had brought them all to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs, but the other basket had very bad figs, so bad that they could not be eaten. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, figs, the good figs very good, and the bad figs very bad, so, that, so bad that they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. 
for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Thanks be to God. Amen. Those of you who have been here before are accustomed to see me preaching from the pulpit, and I will alternate my preaching uh, from the floor of the sanctuary and the pulpit. 
pulpit, but especially today on this homecoming Sunday, I felt it necessary to be as close as possible to this congregation, to all of us who have brought here, been brought here today by our love of God and our concern and care for each other. Would you join me now in prayer for illumination? O oh God of the weak, of the lowly, of the righteous, and the blessed, for all those seeking the path of life in you, bring them a word by which to live in your holy word now given. Amen. And our gospel lesson today is, I think, a familiar one. It comes to us from Luke's 15th chapter, verses 11 through 20. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed his pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to eat and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. You can't go home again. It's a common enough expression. And I guess you can think of it as a nugget of popular wisdom. It's also the title of a well-known novel of a couple of generations ago. When Thomas Wolfe wrote, You Can't Go Home Again, in 1940, he was testifying to both of his personal experience and the lived reality of people like you and me. And this is how Wolfe described this widely held belief in his book. He said, you can't go home, you can't go back home to your family, back home to your childhood, back home to a young man's dreams of glory and of fame, back home to the old forms and systems of things which once seemed everlasting, but which are changing all the time. That, in large part, is what is meant by, you can't go home again. And whether you have ventured from your place of birth or not, I think we all nod in recognition of this central truth of Wolf's statement. You cannot recapture things that by their nature are temporary and fleeting. And it's possible that this whole notion began, well, began in the beginning. Scripture says Adam and Eve were quite content in their Eden home until a series of fateful and fatal decisions propelled them out of paradise permanently. By edict of heaven, reinforced by an angel with a flaming sword, they would never be allowed to go home again. And maybe that's the origin of this sense of alienation and separation from a place we once cherished and called home, but now seems forever denied to us. 
Given all of that, you may find it a bit odd that we've dubbed the church's traditional opening of its program year today as a homecoming. Are we teasing you? Are we being ironic by putting such a label on this day? If you can't go home again, why are we trumpeting a homecoming? Well, we're not teasing, and we're not being ironic, because, because while both what Thomas Wolfe wrote and Genesis testified to, those two things are true enough, but they aren't the whole truth. When you look at the testimony of Scripture from beginning to end, you find lots of homecomings, dozens of them, some of them quite successful. Wanderers like Abraham and Sarah returning to a home that God had destined for them before they were even born. Warriors like David fighting in far-flung battlefields, eventually returning to their cherished homes, which existed largely because of their bravery and devotion. Prophets, like Isaiah, speaking to a people in a wretched exile in Babylon, but conveying to them God's assurances that despite how bleak things appeared at the moment, they would indeed go home again. And then take all of that, that Old, Testament, that Old Testament testimony, and take it into the New Testament, which opens with a homecoming. Matthew's story of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus returning to Israel after fleeing to Egypt because of King Herod's fear of the rumored newborn king, that is, Jesus. But this return comes with a twist. And I want you to be attentive to this because the Bible often delivers twists with its messages, with its counseling, with its advice, with its wisdom. Something comes at us, and we, ex we expect it to turn out a certain way, but it doesn't. The Bible reverses it and gives us a whole new perspective on God's creation and God's will. And you see that in the story that I just mentioned. Because in this return to Israel from Egypt, the Holy Family does not return to the place of Jesus' birth, Bethlehem, but to Nazareth, thereby fulfilling a prophecy that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. And you can see from the string of biblical homecomings that the Bible, as it almost always does, tries to get us to focus on something other than the thing that's dangled before our eyes. Abraham and Sarah, through the agency of God, become the founders of a homeland and the people who will populate it by leaving home. The book of Isaiah, after railing against the weak and wayward exile, exiles of Israel for almost all of its 66 chapters, attributes these, these words to the Lord in its closing. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Home. And then there's that little play on what home is. As the stories of Jesus' birth swing us between Bethlehem not only Jesus' birthplace, but Joseph's ancestral home, swings us between Bethlehem and Nazareth. So what is Jesus' home? Where he was born or where he was raised? Well, cleverly and significantly and poignantly, the Bible ends up telling us neither is his home. So what about that hometown where he was raised, Nazareth? Later, infamously, 
as Jesus is carrying out his early ministry in Galilee, it will be that hometown that rejects Jesus, attempts to kill him, and renders him homeless for the rest of his life. It's a whole new take on homecoming, and it's one that would provoke Jesus to say that unlike the birds of the sky or the animals of the field, I have no place to lay my head. So by negating Bethlehem and Nazareth, is the Bible telling us that what is actually true home is wherever God is to be found? And that could be in a homeless shelter, or it could be on the cross, wherever God is found, is home. And that brings us to the most famous homecoming of all, this one a fictional story told in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. The father's loving and unexpected welcome of his ingrate younger son who has squandered everything his parent has given to him is so well known, I don't have to give any more than repeat the final line of that story that I read to you a moment ago. While he, the son, was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Welcome home, my son. So what's the thread that runs through all of this scriptural homecoming? I would say one thing the Bible does affirm is what Thomas Wolfe wrote. You can't go back home to your childhood, back home to the old forms and systems of things that once seemed everlasting but which are changing all the time. Nostalgia is not something for which the Bible seems to have a great deal of sympathy. But the Bible does offer an emphatic witness to the presence and hand of God in our lives. Always more subtle than perhaps we can detect, more loving for sure than we deserve, more faithful than we would have reason to believe is possible given who we are. While he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. So you and I may think that we're here today out of habit, out of obligation, out of curiosity. But you and I are here today because God willed it so. You heard it proclaimed in that reading from Jeremiah that Jean offered earlier, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Brothers and sisters, you and I are experiencing homecoming today because by the grace of God, we are in the presence of God, the only true home there is. Happy homecoming. Amen. Would you please stand now for our hymn of response?
As we remain standing, would you join me in saying words that we know to be true, our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, printed in the bulletins. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We come to the moment in our worship service where we offer, of all the gifts that God has given us, something back through the work of God's ministry. As people of the new creation, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Here is the table of the Lord, where we are gathered to his supper, for a foretaste of things eternal. Come, when you are fearful, 
to be made new in love. Come when you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come when you are regretful to be made whole. Come old and young, there is room for all. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we give you praise. With our hearts lifted high, our voices full and joyful. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name and no faith and no future, you called us your children. When we lost our way and we turned away, you did not abandon us. When we came back to you, your arms opened wide with welcome. Therefore, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. For these gracious acts of heaven, fill us with gratitude overflowing, that we may share life and love in praise of you, God of all the ages, in the gracious name of Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear now the words of institution by which this holy sacrament is brought to us as a gift. Almighty God, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died, took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on that same night, as the meal drew to a close, Jesus took the common cup And he said to those gathered around the table with whom he had shared so many experiences and loved so much, he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of this cup and eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Dearly beloved, look, here is your Lord coming to you in bread and juice. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
brothers and sisters, would you join me now in a prayer after communion through the divorce? Lord, we have now set your servants free to go in peace. Thank you. 